Hi guys, welcome to the 12th I Measure You Research Review. Uh, this week, Jame and I are pleased to be joined by Daniel Glassbrook from, from Down Under. Thank you for taking the time out on your Friday afternoon, Dan, to join us. No, thanks for having me. Uh, no problem at all. So, this week we will be reviewing the latest paper from Daniel's um, PhD. Um, or hopeful PhD, I say. Um, the, paper's, the paper's titled Measurement of Lower Limb Asymmetry in Professional Rugby League, a technical note describing the use of inertial measurement units. So without further ado, let's get underway. Um, Dan, if you could just start off by telling us a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and, and where you came from, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So, uh, well, I'm, uh, I grew up mostly in New Zealand, um, and then, but prior to that, I was born in South Africa and spent a bit of time in Scotland before going to New Zealand. Um, so I did all my schooling, well, most of my schooling there. Um, I did my first two degrees at the Auckland University of Technology, so my undergrad and my, my master's degree. Um, I come from a sort of strength and conditioning background, but I've uh, kind of gone down more of a biomechanics route in my research. Um, I, my master's in, was more strength and conditioning by slash biomechanics, but now, uh, accelerometry is, is definitely down the biomechanics side of the, of the world. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I come from a bit of that. Um, and then once I, I completed my master's, I had the opportunity to come to Australia and uh, start a PhD, with, um, which is industry-based with the Macquarie University and the South Sydney Rabbitohs, uh, with Dr. Tim Doyle and Dr. Joel Fuller at Macquarie University. Um, so that's kind of a, a short version to, you know, like, few, lived in a few countries and ended up in Australia to, to do some rugby league research. Fascinating. Uh, uh, Daniel, I had no idea you were born in South Africa, to be honest. So it's nice yeah, to meet a South African. People, uh, every time I meet new people, I end up telling them about my life story because they can't figure out my accent. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Daniel, so then... This paper specifically that we're talking about today, how did that come about? What was the lead up to it and what made you decide to say, you know, this is a question we want to answer? Yeah, well, so as mentioned, it is part of my PhD and I've, I've got less than a month left in my PhD. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of the, um, I would say it's like the focal point of my PhD, it, it kind of the PhD builds to this point. Um, and so it, it largely is around, well, my PhD research is largely around wearable technology and exploring how that can be used in team sports, uh, specifically rugby league in, in a rugby league context um, to measure external mechanical load. Um, because team sport athletes, they experience a large amount of workload throughout the week. You know, they run a lot of kilometers um, throughout the week and they have that game load as well in season. Um, and so external mechanical load is typically measured by GPS units. Um, and that's a way of quantifying how much players sort of experience. Um, but GPS isn't representative of the, me of the mechanical load which players experience. And so that's where I come into it, trying to answer and, and quantify a bit of, you know, what's the mechanical load that these athletes are experiencing during their uh, their week to week. Um, so in that route, um, we wanted to also get away from using GPS to do this because there's some obvious flaws with using GPS to measure mechanical load um, at the lower limb specifically. Um, the, the GPS units are placed between the shoulder blades, whereas we're kind of interested in what's happening at, at the lower limb. So there's that disparity in placement. And some, some research has also shown that GPS units, when they try and calculate what's going on at the lower limb, they're actually, they're not very effective at that. Um, and then following on from that, like we know that we can put accelerometers, we can put IMUs on the lower limb to measure mechanical load or a surrogate of mechanical load at the lower limb. But mechanical load is, is not just impacts. And so we want to go into a bit of looking at the, the external mechanical load as a whole. Um, so inclusive of impacts, but recognizing that um, there's more to load than just impacts, so that there's eccentric stuff going on, there's breaking forces and all that, and we wanted to look at it globally. Fascinating. Really, really interesting. And I know you, you touched upon it briefly there, but if we could kind of dive into the objectives of this paper, what you, what you hypothesized? Yeah, well, I'll, um, I'll bring up the paper and uh, then I can you know, have that to reference to. Um, but yeah, so what we hypothesized, the, the, 
one of the hypothesis, hypotheses sorry, around this paper is, is we also looked at asymmetry. Um, so with this paper, we, we wanted to look at, um, is it feasible to use accelerometers during um, rugby league match play as a, as a feasible method of quantifying external mechanical load? And then when we quantify this external mechanical load, are we able to detect clinically relevant or clinically meaningful asymmetries with this method? Um, so we hypothesized that the technique would be, would be feasible to do this um, and that we'd be able to detect difference between positions um, or detect asymmetries between positions. And then, uh, Daniel, just, I mean, so there's quite a few things you were looking at there. Mm -hmm. And obviously we can see at the methods there, we've got four participants in the study. How did you go about it? What, you, I know you briefly mentioned to us prior to this call about, uh, you know, the difficulty of get, gathering your participants. So mm -hmm. how did you get your participants? How did you choose them? And, you know, how did you go about gathering all your data for the paper? Yeah, cool. So we only had um, four participants in the end, and that was, it was largely restricted by how many accelerometers we had. Um, so we only had eight IMUs uh, to, to use at our disposal. Uh, disposal, sorry. Um, and so that restricted us to how many players we could use. Um, so that it meant we could only use four players. And so we ended up choosing the four players who we had the biggest buy-in with. Uh, we piloted with a lot of different players across the team um, and then went with the four players who were, you know, gung-ho for the research and they were able to wear it for the most sessions um, throughout the seasons as, as they were able to. Um, so we went about it, selecting our participants that way by piloting and, you know, kind of gauging who was um, into it, for lack of a better phrase, um, and then went with the four who were going to be the most consistent and reliable to be able to get the most data on from them. Um, so in terms of how we did it, uh, we went with these four participants um, and we placed the IMUs on the dorsal foot. Uh, so instead of placing it on the tibia, which is which has been done in, in research prior to look at uh, lower limb load or a surrogate of, of load. Uh, we went with the dorsal foot as a place to reduce the risk of injury um, from any sort of impact to the sensor on the tibia in a team sport context. And we're working with professional athletes here. It's important we recognize we, we reduce injury as much as we can. Uh, so we went with the dorsal foot, which we had done previous research on to show that there, it produces similar results to what's going on with the tibia. Um, it produces typically uh, larger accelerations than what you'd experience with the tibia, but the pattern of the acceleration is the same. So if you can't compare placement to placement, it'd be comparing apples to oranges, but you can compare within the same placement. So we, um, we found that it was a good place for um, placing it where we wouldn't get risk of injury. Plus the players didn't ever notice it when it was on their boats. But if we put it on their tibia, they would kind of notice it while they're running a bit more. Um, so there's a bit of background why we chose that sort of placements. The, um, we, had a, we, had a, we had 11 to 13 sessions where the players wore these for um, match simulations. So these were in training where it was a simulation where we were replicating the a rugby league match. Um, which I've got a little video of just to put a bit of context in that. It's 10 seconds long. It's, um, there's no video to this, but this is where the players would be wearing the IMUs on their boots. Um, so you can see that there, we have referees come into training for a few of these sessions where it's really, it's, it's 13 on 13 looking like an actual, an actual match there. So it's the closest we can get to an actual rugby league match without being in a set, a competitive match. Um, and these players will, re will regularly do these sort of matches in training. Sorry to, to interrupt, Daniel. We couldn't actually see the video. So you may have to oh. stop, share, and, and reshare. It'd be good to kind of see, okay. see that video. Um, stop sharing screen and reshare? Yeah, yeah, if you stop sharing your screen, you should be able to pop. Oh, my apologies. I thought that would have, uh, would have gone straight away. Let's, uh, let's try that no again. <laughs> there we go. Can you see that? We can, yep. yep. All right, cool, so does. I'll play that again. Um, it's just a couple of plays out of a, a training. Um, well, the simulations which I've just been describing. Um, you'll notice the guys in the yellow uh, jerseys are the referees. Um, and it's two teams uh, of 13 on 13. So it's, it's as close to a, a match as we can get without um, having it in a competitive match. 
fantastic it's great to 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 see the technology being applied to um your your match simulations and as close to being part of a, a professional um match as, as possible i guess um now, if, if you can, Dan, it would be great to kind of summarise your, your findings. So maybe kind of what, what key metrics you were looking for, um, what positions the players were in and kind of what the differences were between the players. Yeah, sure. So uh, in my background earlier, I was explaining about, you know, we wanted to go away from impacts and kind of just looking at peak impacts. And so to that end, we used two new variables to... Um, to quantify external mechanical load, and the first of which was error underneath the curve, uh, which is a measure of an accumulation of load, um, and the second of which was the percentage of time that the accelerometer is experienced in seven different bands of accelerations. Um, so that could, that's, we had from zero, well, negative accelerations at less than zero Gs to greater than 16 Gs um, was our range across those seven bands. So. We, um, we went away from using kind of your traditional impact variable to um, a more specific and applied example of something which we can use to look at the global load across or the, the load across a whole simulation. Okay. So that, that's, yeah, Daniel, that's great. So just, I want to just touch on area under the curve for two seconds. Sure. Um, it, you know, for a lot of the, the viewers out there, I'm sure not a lot of them, too many of them would know what area under the curve is. I, I know you gave a brief understanding. Could you explain how that came about for yourself personally? I know you wanted to look at the accumulation, but was there, was there any of your supervisors or did you come up with the idea of, you know, this is the research you looked at or how did area under the curve really fit into your study? Yeah, so that's, um, it can be answered by going through, you know, collaborative sort of effort with the supervisors. Um, so it was, um, yeah, it, it came through discussion around that and what, you know, what do accelerometers give us, what IMUs can give us, and what can we get that's meaningful that we can apply in a, in a context? And area of the curve is, is a variable which can be applied in this context and others. Um, and we were able to write pretty good um, scripts or, sorry, program to be able to get that out of the data. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, no, that, that's it. Sorry, I know that that's a was an unscripted question, but I was just really curious um, no, you know, no, just to dive a bit deeper because it's a fascinating topic. And then, so what's next for Dr. Glassbrook? I'll, I'll, I'll put the positive energy into the universe. And so what's next for Dr. Glass, Glassbrook in terms of research and, you know, follow, pra following practice? Um, I think... Uh... I think I'd like to do a lot more applied research. Um, it's pretty pretty awesome working at this sort of level with professional athletes. And in terms of research, the application of wearable technology in this sort of um, sports is, is, is it's kind of it's in an infancy in a way where there's a lot of stuff that can be done um, and could and should be moved into. Uh, of course, we have GPS and we have accelerometers moving into the space, but um, I'd like to kind of do a bit more of that. Fantastic. And in, in um, terms of the, the application of um, percentage time at intensity bands and area under the curve, Dan, I mean, do you, do you see a place for that in elite sport? Do you see that as something or measurements that could be, could be applied going forward to your, your team-based sports, the pitch-based sports, say? Yeah, for sure. And I think, um, I think it was actually asked before, which, which got brushed over a little bit more about these results here that, you know, we, with these variables, we were able to find that it, we we're able to measure external mechanical load at the lower limb during match play. And so, you know, we we're able to discover what's going on throughout all these different zones or acceleration bands at a player. Um, and so I think that it's definitely a place which can be improved and, or, or, or continually researched. Um, we also did find asymmetry and, and that's another kind of important thing when we're looking at um, injury perspectives. Um, if, you know, it's known that asymmetry can have an effect, effect on uh, injury uh, potential. Um, so to answer your question, I think that yes, this, this sort of stuff is, is pretty exciting. It's, it's going away from your traditional just peak impacts and looking at another area. And it's definitely something which we found good results in. 
and we found that it worked well. We got good buy-in and off that, it's something which we should be used. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your, for your time, uh, Dan. As I say, we appreciate you joining us on a, on a Friday evening, your time. Um, just to, to put it out there quickly, if, if people do want to, to discuss your research, obviously we'll share it when, when we put the, the video out. Um, are they best contacting you via Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, email? Yeah, I mean, Twitter is, Twitter is easy. Um, I, I have only a month left to my, my PhD, so my, my email may change pretty quickly. Yep. Um, but yeah, for sure, Twitter is easy as, it's just uh, D underscore Glassbrook, um, and then you know, I'll be able to see that message at least, and then we can talk about emails. That's fantastic. Well, uh, thanks again for, for your time. Um, as I just mentioned, we will be sharing the, the link to the, the full paper in, in our social media posts. So, Jame, have you got any final closing comments? No, that's all from me. Dan, just yeah, had to, some really good research. I really enjoyed reading it. Some interesting topics. I really like the, the train of thought, and I, I hope there's some more to come. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great stuff. See you next time. Thank you.